Past performance may not be indicative of future results. Therefore, no current or prospective client should assume that the future performance of any specific investment, investment strategy, including the investments and or investment strategies recommended and or purchased by advisor or product made reference to directly or indirectly will be profitable. Different types of investment involve varying degrees of risk and there can be no assurance that any specific investment will either be suitable or profitable for a client's investment portfolio. No client or prospective client should assume that any information presented serves as the receipt of or substitute for personalized investment advice from the advisor or any other investment professional. Welcome to the Bullington Capital Report, hosted by Bill Bullington. For the next hour, you'll receive information on current market conditions and trends that could affect your financial future. If you have a question, you can participate in today's program by calling 216-901-0945. That's 216-901-0WHK. You can also reach Bill by going to his website, BullingtonCapital.com. And now, here's Bill Bullington. Well, welcome back. We are actually live this morning. So if you'd like to call in with a question, no problem. 216-901-0945. If you uh, hear something on this show that you'd like more information on, now feel free to go to my website, click on the contact us form, and um, it actually would kind of help if you would fill out the area that says questions. <laughs> A lot of people uh, come in, they, they fill out all their contact information, and I have no idea what, you know, what I should prepare for them when I call them back. So anyway, um, that would be nice. Uh, a little easier and a lot of, uh, man, you know, there is always stuff going on. And I was just thinking that, I don't know if it's just that much more because, you know, 30 years ago when I started in this business, it's hard for me to believe that it's been that long, but <laughs> I'm getting old <laughs> and uh, it's just mind boggling the pace of change and the pace of change seems to be speeding up fairly significantly. And that, that's a good thing for everybody. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, that, the, you know, the economy, where we're seeing growth, what's happening in, in different sectors. But you know what? What's really interesting to me, too, about this kind of stuff, the economic statistics that come out, they're normally behind the times. The uh, and. This is not new. It's kind of been that way, you know, for the, my entire career. And back when I was way back in the day when I'm sitting in a class at Kent State, listening to one of the econ professors saying stocks are leading economic indicators. What? Yes, they tend to move before the underlying economy actually starts to move. I wonder why that is. Well, because there are certain people who have access to really good information, have a lot of courage. And are out there in front. So they're generally um, moving ahead of the news. And back in those days, it was, uh, I think they were about 9 to 12 months in advance of what you'd see showing up uh, in the economy. The market was 9 to 12 months in advance. I don't even know what it is now. But uh, in today, it's actually on a company-by-company -company basis almost. Almost. But if you start... Now, if you want to take a really good example of this is, you know, the pandemic hits, market goes down a lot, market bounces and starts recovering and everybody's going, oh, no, oh, no. And guess what? The uh, economy is recovering way faster than the boldest predictions had had been, which is not unusual, by the way. Um, predictions on what's going to happen in the future are incredibly difficult to get accurate. So, but if you get in the general direction, that, that, that's fine. And anyway, so the economy has been picking back up significantly. And a lot of the industries that have been affected by this, um, in a, in a good way are actually still, you know, gaining more benefits because of the demand for the products in their fields. And in the meantime, you know, the world's gone on, the population's actually grown a little bit, and 
demand grows. So in other words, there's a lot, a lot to be thankful for. There's a lot to be thankful for. There's when I'm looking at where money is being spent, what, what types of industries are experiencing the fastest growth. It's very encouraging, especially if you have a 10 year time horizon. Now, if you don't have a 10 year time horizon, it's a, because you just don't know any better. (laughs) Um, B, you just, you're resisting it. So, and, and this is one of the risks that a lot of people that are getting close to retirement are taking. You might be too heavily invested in stocks. Now, don't get me wrong. I have about 75% of my money invested in stocks. Now, I, somewhere between 75 and 80, it's a, um, which is very heavy. I mean, that's extremely heavy. And if the market were to go down and I'm, I'm down 30 or 40%, I'm fine with that. That's, but I I don't plan on retiring in the next 10 years. If I were planning on retiring in the next 10 years, I probably wouldn't be doing that. I'd probably have a lot more money in short-term bonds or an alternative. And that's kind of, that's what we'll talk about in the next, next segment. And in the last segment, we'll talk a little bit about individual stocks because that's kind of how I got my start in the industry. Um, I still do a lot in that with individual stocks and I get a lot of listeners out there that are like, Hey, when are you going to talk about individuals? So I'm, I'm going to chop this up into thirds. First third, we're going to talk about the economy in uh, stock market in generality and in, uh, interest rates. The second part, we're going to focus a little bit more on the interest rate portion uh, because it's a very large portion of markets and rightly so. But there aren't a lot of options that are extremely attractive right now. And some things that can happen are or some things that you that might look attractive when you look deeper into them are not nearly as attractive as they appear on the surface. We'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that, too, and what, what kind of alternatives that you have. So having said that, I'll uh, continue on with the economy, and I've been trying to bring up my uh, computer, you know, technology is wonderful when it's working, but when it's uh, <laughs> when it's giving you problems, which they have a tendency to do a lot of, I don't know if you've noticed that or not, really makes me nervous. You know, you, you notice you haven't really heard a whole lot about the self-driving cars. I mean, you, you hear about it a little bit, not nearly as much as you did before they actually started selling them and realizing, hey, we got some problems here. <laughs> yes, you're going to have to fix those. Those are going to have to, there's a lot of work there which is not a bad thing because it employs an enormous number of people. And it's going to employ a lot more people in the future than it does today. So, but they, they've got a way to go yet. (laughs) And I'm not, uh, uh, and I'm not upset, you know, it's going to keep, uh, I've been driving to what is it? It's hard to believe 42 years. Yeah. Wow. So if you can do the math and you'll, you'll know how old I am, but, uh, been a long time. I, I don't mind driving. Uh, I think it's kind of cool. My car does assist a little bit. Uh, so well, it's supposed to. And actually, when you start crossing into another lane, it'll turn it back into the lane that you're in unless you put your turn signal on. So that it's kind of cool. It's actually a computer on wheels. And uh, when I slow down and stop at a traffic light, it shuts off. You know, when I traffic light turns green, it turns back on again. It's it, it's amazing. What all the, and all that stuff, by the way, had to be built. And that wasn't here. You didn't see that kind of stuff 15 years ago. And 10 years ago, some of the super high-end cars had it. But now it's coming in, you know, every, you know, a Corolla, the, uh, which is a good car. You know, it's a great car, actually. But the, uh, it's, it's amazing how that technology just continues to, to advance. And really, it, it's the cause of most of our uh, employment. They're getting into so many things. I was just reading about, and this kind of ties into the economy. There's a steel company, um, Steel Dynamics, are publicly traded. I'm not recommending that the company, um, steel companies have been notoriously hard to manage because the profit margins in those industries generally are not very high. But they're building a plant to build some uh, special steel that's been designed specifically for driverless cars. Think about that for a second. 
They're building a multi-billion dollar facility here in the United States to make special metal for the driverless cars. What might that metal have that the other metal doesn't have? Probably it's actually not what it has. It what it, it's what it doesn't have. It's going to it's going to be a lot lighter than the the normal steel that would use in a normal car. In how many people are is that going to employ? I'm looking at the the video that they had on their website. Uh, it was actually a drone video. Drones didn't exist, you know. I mean, they did exist, but they were too expensive, you know, 15 years ago. Now you got a company having people in their own PR staff out there flying around taking video and editing the video in house. How crazy is that? I mean, that that kind of stuff just didn't happen, you know, 10 to 15 years ago. Or if if it did, it was very very minuscule. So uh, my point here is that there's a lot of growth. I mean, we still Oh, it's somewhere around 17 or 18 million car, new cars a year come out and are sold in the United States. That's a lot of cars, especially new cars. And all the metal that goes into that, that you know, again, industry, technology, it brings about new opportunities, new challenges. You, you got to keep up with it. But, and then this plant that they're building, the plant's got all kinds of patents on it. By the way, the uh, one of the reasons that this company... Well, this I actually I can't verify this because this was not in their financial statements. But I just was tooling around on the internet and take it for whatever it's worth. It might not even be true, but the company was building this plant mainly for a uh, to provide a lot of the steel to Tesla. So that's kind of interesting. Now, whether it's true or not, I have no idea. So don't run out and don't run out and buy a stock that that you hear people talking about uh, from anybody, unless you actually do a lot of the research yourself. And again, we come back later in today's show. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. What kind of things do you really want to know about before you invest your money into a stock if you're a long-term investor? Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later. But my, my point here was, if they're going to build an entire factory that's going to employ thousands of people and they're going to spend on this factory about half of what their total income was the year before, that's a major commitment. <laughs> that is a huge commitment. What does that mean? Well, it means that there are an awful lot of people working right now. And those people that are working are, are buying cars, you know, or have cars, buying food, buying clothing, paying rent or a mortgage payment, probably kids' tuition, all kinds of stuff. So the economy grows as a result of that. And see, uh, I'm not sure how many people ever really stop to think about that sort of thing and, and why economies grow. How do economies, af are, how are they able to afford that? And the answer to that is actually the money supply, and that's controlled by the Fed. And very difficult job, would not want that job. Incredibly difficult. This guy's, thankfully, we have some incredibly intelligent people running the show there. Very impressed with that. I mean, I'm incredibly impressed with the job that they've been able to do. You know, you look around, things are actually pretty good. Despite the fact that we still have a pandemic and people are still getting sick, things are, are pretty good. And they're coming and they're getting better. And I can see a day, you know, five, ten years from now where it's even better than it is today. Fifteen, twenty years from now, I think it's gonna be you probably won't recognize it. It's like if these kids coming out of college today, I, I laugh about this all the time. I am um Involved with someone who has a, a couple of actually triplets that just graduated college, and I listen to their conversations, and I, I I think they're funny. They're talking about a lot of the stuff that that they're using today, and and all the technology that they use, and they just they've grown up with it. It's just it's part of who they are as a generation. And I just remember thinking, you know, when I grew up, we had three television stations: ABC, NBC, CBS, and then you had a couple of local stations, and that was it. <laughs> five stations and when the president came on to do a speech your night was shot you <laughs> i remember waiting for the uh, uh uh whatever that picture was that came up and the and the sound when the stations the stations would actually sign off every night they wouldn't broadcast broadcast for a few hours and uh, to talk to them about that they look like you like they, they look at me like yeah 
how old are you? <laughs> that's that's the uh, reaction I get. But yeah, different world. And you know what's really interesting about it though? It's uh, all the stuff that we see today. It's been written about. It back in those days, it was mostly newspapers that that would write about it. You had some magazines, yeah, magazines out there. You didn't have the internet, so you didn't have as much stuff in many ways to go out and take a look at what's happening. And I think, actually, it may be a little harder today just because you have so many more choices, more uh, avenues. And a lot of times people are publishing stuff that, you know, just it's not accurate. Uh, And I like to give them the benefit of the doubt. Say they They just got it wrong. But there's a lot of stuff out there that, that's not real good. And uh, reading that's kind of hard because it makes me have to read a whole lot more to check into something. When something sounds too good to be true, oh, about nine times out of ten, it's too good to be true. <laughs> so you have to look a lot harder. And uh, I don't know what he likes to, to, to do. Well, yeah, some people do, I guess. Yeah, I, I talk to him occasionally. He'll uh, email me or, or we'll, we'll write. But my whole point of this whole thing today is, is, you know, if you look out over the next 10 years, there's a really good chance that stocks will do better than bonds, especially since bonds rates, interest rates are nearly zero. I mean, hang on a second, actually. I'm going to take a look at this. I have, um, you know, let me see. I've got a subscription to the Wall Street Journal. And on there, you can go to the markets and you go to market data home. And they have bonds and rates there. So I'm just going to click on that right now. I'm going to the U.S. Treasuries. It's pulling this up. And surely enough, the Internet connection is really slow. (laughs) So the yield on a 30-year bond right now is 1.9%. That's a 30-year. 1.9. A 10-year note is 1.3. So 1.3 for 10 years. A one-year is 0.072. A two year is 0.2, 0.2%, two years. You gotta lock your money up for two years. Now you can sell it before that, but it may be higher or lower than the price you paid for it if you try to get out of it early. Okay. So this is kind of what I was talking about. I think over the next 10 years that stocks probably are going to outperform fixed income, but it's not prudent to have 100% of your money in fixed income. And I plan on working for I'm going to be working for another, at least another 12 years, minimally. Now that I hear the, the music, I'm going to have to put off my work for about five minutes while you listen to this commercial break. <laughs> it's Bill Bullington right here on 1420. Stay tuned. I'll be right back. listening to Bill Bullington. I'm here every Saturday morning from 11 to noon. If you'd like to reach out to me, just go to my website, bullingtoncapital.com. There's a contact us page there, or you can call 330-664-0700. We will try to get back to you as quickly as we possibly can. And uh, you know, we'll talk about your situation. Um, so it's every week now, by the way, this is kind of a, a new format. I'm going to try to talk about um, economics because that's the economy is is really driven by businesses, and a lot of the businesses are publicly traded, like Amazon, Microsoft, you know, the uh, Netflix, Facebook, um, the steel companies that, that we were talking about a little bit earlier. There are a lot of companies that are behind the scenes that employ hundreds of millions of people, and um, most people aren't really aware of them or, or what they even do, and, and they're like part of the backbone of the economy. So let's shed a little bit of light on that, how things are going. They're going very well right now, particularly, you know, 
in light of, of everything that's that's been happening. And I know a lot of people are really um, befuddled by that. I would love to pull out my shows from March of 2020 when I was talking about what this was. <laughs> and it, it's not magic. I mean, it, it really isn't. It's just I've been around for a while and I try to pay attention to what's happening and how things actually work versus how things uh how people think things might work, you know, which I always kind of fall back on the old Samuel Clement uh, saying that uh, it's not what people don't know that hurts them. It's what they know that ain't so. <laughs> yeah. And that's a, uh, that that's tough. You know, managing money is tough. You've got all this news flying around all the time. And sometimes the stocks react to it in a well, actually, a lot of times stocks will react to it in just the exact opposite fashion that you think they will. And why am I talking so much about stocks? Well, because with interest rates as low as they are and not likely to go up anytime soon, okay, it, it's like almost all you have left. Okay. Now, you do have these annuities. I know some people really cringe when I say annuity. And I haven't, I haven't used annuities up until about 18 months ago for over a decade. You know, because they weren't competitive, is in my opinion. Now, there's a bunch of different types out there. There's one that's an investment only. There's no sales charge in or out. Okay, no penalty. You don't have to hold on to it for a certain amount of time. You can add a rider to it that will guarantee a minimum income, no matter what happens. How cool is that? That is awesome. And then you have now. Uh, there are others that are they're called fixed index. You've heard me talking about that. Those are fixed, and the fixed rates, the guaranteed rates that they're going to give you, um, payout ratios, uh, they, uh, they come with, they're more traditional, but these are relatively new as well because everything's always changing. And you can get a fixed rate of return on those, and you, the company that's issuing it will put that in writing for you. Okay, So that's, that's a big deal, especially with interest rates being as low as they are now. If you can get a much higher rate, then you could get on a CD, and it's not a CD, and you shouldn't, actually, I shouldn't even be comparing it to a CD. They are not the same thing. A CD, you can sell immediately or cash it in immediately, and your principal is guaranteed by the FDIC or, S, you know, if, if, yeah, FDIC. So it's not the same thing, but people are using them for sources of income. If you're looking for sources of income for retirement, then they make sense. They make a lot of sense. If you're a younger person and you're looking to accumulate assets, that's what the uh, investment-only annuity is probably a very good option for. You can still get some guarantees on the underlying investments, but you get to invest your money up to 100% in stock funds. And these stock funds are from Vanguard, Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, you name it. There's like, and it's close to 400 and it works a lot like your 401k plans do. You put money in there. You don't get to deduct it, um, but you get put money in there. You can switch it around and not have to pay taxes on it until you actually start to take it out. So you don't get a 1099 at the end of the year saying, okay, you've made these changes. You rebalance your portfolio, and now here's the uh, capital gains and dividends that you have to pay taxes on. That, that money stays in your account and continues to grow on a tax-deferred basis. In this particular one, it's super flexible, super flexible. You can put money into it. You can take money out. You probably don't want to take money out before you're 59 and a half because this is, you're getting tax deferral. And if the government's going to give you that gift, there's, there, there are catches to it. The catch is you're supposed to be supplementing your retire, your retirement with this. So if it's not retirement money, not probably not a good idea. If it is retirement money, great. There's no limit on this. Like you have a, a non-deductible IRA for people who are in really high tax brackets and can't um, make a non-deductible IRA contribution. Well, those are capped at $6,000 anyway. And this one's unlimited. Put whatever you want in there, and it's going to be tax deferred until you take it out. Uh, if you start taking it out before you're 59 and a half, you got a problem because, you know, because they're giving you that tax deferral, you have to keep it in there. The, the idea is to help you save for retirement with these products. They shouldn't be used for anything else, really. So um, anyway, that one uh, is a, it's called an investment-only annuity. Feel free, again, to reach out uh, and ask more questions on it. 
I think this is awesome. Between that product and the fixed index and just regular portfolios, you're good. You got every base covered there. Every base is covered. Somebody's going to say, well, what about commodities? Well, some of the funds I have actually have commodities in them. So, yeah. And that should be part of a a well-diversified portfolio. I don't like to put a lot of money into those uh, that are heavily invested in commodities because it's pretty tough. And a lot of the funds that I invest in also have real estate investment trust inside the portfolio. Typically, it's, you know, anywhere from 5 to 10%, which is, that's a fairly hefty weighting in a particular fund. So, um, bottom line is, if you'd like a certain portion of your money guaranteed, and, and again, if you're within 10 or 15 years from retirement, that's when you start thinking about this. You don't want to get up to retirement age. I mean, you know how many people I talked to that retired in 1998 or 1999 or the year 2000 had most of their money in stocks and then watched the stock market drop over 50% in a, over a three year time period. It's like Chinese water torture. And not a good idea. <laughs> you, you don't want to work your entire lifetime to get up to that point and then be forced to take money out to supplement. Because by the way, when you take that money out, it's never coming back. The money that you spent uh, out of those funds is not coming back. doesn't have a chance to recover. So there's a, there's a balancing act there. If you take a look at how much you need to, to have, and by the way, this is totally between you and your advisor or you and your wife, or you know, if you're doing it yourself, you should write this stuff down. The, uh, there's no one right answer for this. There's a, a, a good answer for you. Everybody's situation is a little bit different. And, and I guess I'm, I'm still so kind of surprised that, that a lot of people think that there's a one size fits all. And I know that's what we want. Everybody wants that. Hey, take this magic pill and you'll lose weight. Yeah, great. The, um, or this is the one thing that everybody should be doing. Or if you're not doing this, you're making a mistake. Well, maybe, maybe not. Everybody's a little bit different here. I'm sure a lot of people would be uncomfortable doing, uh, being as aggressive as, as I am. I'm sure there are some people, I know there are, that are more aggressive than I am. Okay. So you have to try to find what's right for you, what feels right for you. Try to get someone, when you're talking to an advisor, try to get them to, to show you, you know, well, how'd this do when the market crashed? Okay, Because if they're financial advisors, they've got access to software that'll show you that. Uh, and if they don't, then I would probably get another <laughs> I'd probably look for another advisor, but we can show you, Hey, during this time period, you know, 2008, 2009, actually it started in November of 2007. If you're large companies, if you were small or a uh, emerging market, it started in April of 2007. Talk about a long time period. That was a three year drop three years in a row. And they don't really talk a whole lot about that because they're, I'm, my feeling is that, uh, they just want to avoid that uncomfortable conversation. I don't. I, I want you to know. I, I want you to know what you're up against because it's a, uh, you're going to see it one day. And if you're looking out over a 10, 15, 20-year time period, I think, great. You know that, that gives you a lot more wiggle room. If you're looking at pulling income out of today, there is no way you belong in a 100% stock portfolio unless – the, the dividend yield is more than you're spending now. Why do I say it's got to be more than you're spending now? Well, because you're going to have to pay taxes. Right? So it needs to be about 25% more than you're spending. So if you're spending, uh, you know, a hundred, let's say you're spending $60,000. If the dividend yield on the funds that you have uh, is not paying $60,000, actually paying about, what is it? Uh, somewhere in the low seventies. If it's not paying more than seventy thousand dollars, if the dividend yield is not more than seventy thousand dollars, then you can't afford to live on a dividend yield, uh, and you should not have your you shouldn't have your money invested that way. That's actually a horrible example, by the way, because that, that, that that's going to lead somebody to take on way too much risk. Okay. And that's where the uh, uh, sitting down and just get a general picture. It doesn't have to be complicated. 
Figure out what your basic living expenses are and how much in money and retirement income you're going to have. Then you compare the two, and you have a really good idea of what you need to do at that point. And have a really good idea of what you would need to do at that point. And it, you know, literally, it, it normally takes me about 10 or 15 minutes uh, to actually put a, pull a plan together if somebody has that information. And, but you, and you need to know what that information is. You, you really have to have a good estimate of what you think your monthly budget should be. And for people that are used to doing that, they're like, what, doesn't everybody do that? And uh, I got news for you. Yeah, maybe one out of five, maybe one out of five actually sits down and thinks about this seriously. So, and, and you have to do it, by the way. You have to have some idea of what your, what a livable budget would be. Now, when you're in your 40s, that's really hard to do. Okay, that's really hard to do because what are, you know, what are prices going to be like in 25 years? Now, the inflation rate fluctuates all over the place. So you have to make some um, adjustments there or, or some estimations, but you know, using a, a three and a half, four percent rate, I think under current conditions would probably be fine, but that's something, again, you want to sit down and talk about these things with somebody who's done this before and it, or not, you know, you could take notes. You could go back and, and replay this show and, uh, get your budget together. Take a look at your assets, take about four and a half percent of your assets and add that to whatever sources of income you might get. If you're going to get a projection on a pension or Social Security, you just add whatever that might be, uh, and uh, there you go. You are done. It, it Actually, it's going to be a little bit more complicated than that for the younger people. Uh, if you're, even if you're like 55, 65, you know, what a, here's what I'm doing now, 10 years from now, what that might be. What, what might that be? Now, we have some software, by the way, that, that does that for us. It does those calculations. It adjusts for inflation, and that's the big one. The farther you are away from retirement, the more that's going to become a factor. And I know that's hard. That's why I'm telling you. Get an advisor. Uh, get some. If you don't want to talk to an advisor, get a soft, get software, something that actually has a an inflation projection in it. A lot of the software I see, if you have to be careful with that too. It, it shows a 10% annual average return for their stocks. Not a good idea. Yeah, not a good idea. Yes, that's been the average if you go all the way back to the 1920s. Okay. But there are several 20-year periods where the return is a third of that. There's a lot of 10-year periods where the return is negative. Okay, So if you were thinking about those really high returns, and then they come in at a, a much lower rate, but you did your plan on the higher return, you're going to have big problems. You're going to have huge problems. And that's where things like the fixed index annuities come in, by the way, because those rates, they're guaranteed by the companies that issue them. So they're only as good as the companies. There, there's not a government agency, a federal government agency, rather, standing behind them. Each state has its own insurance fund. You're not really even supposed to talk about that. But the uh, uh, the bottom line is you want to deal with solid companies. Uh, understand that they're going to stand by that. Uh, if they, you know, if they can't make the payment, it's not going to, it's going to be bad. Normally they get sold to other insurance companies and the people that have products like that have taken a haircut. Uh, not always, but, and they are a lot safer than a lot of other investments. So, uh, again, that's something that you have to consider. You know, I would, uh, actually, I would hate to be somebody who has worked their entire lives. You're getting up into your mid fifties, early sixties, early seventies, early eighties to have to know all this stuff you have to know. <laughs> that is brutal. The, uh, and I am so glad that I'm, that I'm in this field so that I'm aware of all these things. And uh, it's tough. It's unbelievable how much the law changes every year regarding a lot of these investments, a lot of these, you know, a lot of the tax laws, a lot of the estate planning laws, property ownership. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I feel bad for, for people because I feel your pain, believe me. I spend, oh, probably half my time looking up the answers to questions that I've never heard before. Think about that for a second. I've been doing this 30 years. <laughs> Anyway, 
I hear the music. That means I got to take another commercial break. This is Bill Bullington right here on 1420. Stay tuned because I'll be right back. And we're back. Hey, if you've heard something that you liked here, you can go to my website at bullingtoncapital.com and you can send me a, a comment, ask me to call you back. I'll be glad to do that. Um, normally, I would be uh, answering phones and I have to actually jump up for a second and get the phone. Are you going to put them through? Oh, okay. <laughs> Never mind. My uh, board operator is going to put the call through. And the number here, if you'd like to call, is 216-901-0945. And I have Chris. Chris, you have a question for me? Hey, yeah. Last week, I guess you had a pre-recorded show, but yeah. on that show, you talked about a, someone would put $100,000 into this annuity to get a $5,000 payment um, for the year because they wanted to protect their, you know, pay for their sure. Medicare supplement program. Right, right. My question is this. Uh, so you give them 100000 You're 12 years into this. They've paid you out sixty grand. You drop dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, where's the other Where's the other 40000 going? Well, it depends on what the investment's done because it is invested. Uh, if, okay. it's, if the value is less than 40000 they will make up the difference to you. They've got this thing called a return of premium uh, guarantee. You can't get back less than you put into it. So... Uh, gonna... Okay, so you will, so you'll, so you will make your hundred thousand back at least. Yeah, is what you're saying. Yep. No right. matter if you drop dead or not. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so that's pretty cool. By the All way, right. that uh, um, website. If you want to email me, I can email you a link over to it, and you can uh, kind of okay. play around with it. Put your own numbers in there, because it, yeah. it it does depend on your age and uh, yeah, your age basically. Okay. All right. Hey. Yeah. Uh, well. Okay. Well, that's all. If you got other callers. Uh, I have oh. other questions, but the, no, I get you. You're you're good. I, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I'm just curious. What is what is wrong with these Wall Street advisors when it comes to you know you talk about the 30 year bond being 1.9 percent, and then you look around at a lot of good companies, uh, a lot of banks particularly, and the dividends are uh, anywhere from three and a half, four and a half, four point seven five, <laughs> and. Well, why don't those stock? Why aren't those stocks higher? I don't. I don't understand it. Uh, like, I'll give you an example: Huntington Bank, which I actually bought a couple of weeks ago when it when it fell to like thirteen dollars and forty cents or something. Uh, it was paying like a four point six percent dividend, and I sit there and I go, "Why aren't Why aren't people buying these things? I mean, why don't insurance companies buy them?" Oh, I, I, I'm uh, sure a lot of uh, if if uh, if Huntington Bank you, is a good investment no normally they they drop because you know they missed earnings or something like that the uh, but the earnings were fine that's the thing yeah. earnings are fine okay yeah. but well what i'm saying is that you, you don't know why the drop may come it may be because a large hedge fund decided you know to change directions and just decided to sell one hedge fund could do that no sweat and one uh, or an ETF or an actively managed fund, maybe they saw something they liked better, and maybe they've already they've been in Huntington for an extremely long time and have collected those dividends over the year, and, and their cost basis is five bucks. So they decide, you know what, um, we like that one better. Move on. Yeah, and you just have no idea. I mean, it, it could be so many. There's there are way more funds than there are stocks for them to invest in. <laughs> and, yeah. and that's yeah. one of the reasons, uh, you know, when I'm, uh, uh, like I, I'll have very few stocks that, that I just buy and, and, and set aside. And by the way, the price to sales ratio on Huntington's three, which is the long-term average for a bank, uh, which is fine. That's absolutely yeah. fine. Uh, the dividend yield I've got, uh, pulling up at 4% actually, because the uh, price is, yeah. Came, yeah. yeah, price came down a little well, look, bit. Look at it like three weeks ago. It was 4.4. Yeah. It was like 4.5 weeks ago. Yeah. So, 
that's why I sit here and I go, uh, are these people just stupid or what? <laughs> I don't, I don't get it. Well, no, it's, uh, it's not necessarily, it's, it, it, yeah, it, there's, there are a lot of things that, that could cause that now. I mean, like I said, you, you have minimally, there are minimally four times the number of funds than there are stocks for them to invest in. So, and those funds, yeah. you know, they've got different directives. A lot of times, you know, they will be part of a, a large pension fund and the pension decides, you know, that they're going to make some changes and it has nothing to do with the company. It's yeah. the, the fund had to liquidate because this big multi-billion dollar pension funds decided they, they've hired a new manager. They don't own that stack uh, or the money's just got to go from one management firm to another firm. So it has nothing to do with anything yeah. and it can drive those things down. Now, that's highly unlikely what I just said, by the way, but the uh, yeah. but it is a possibility. And the, the more likely cause is somebody somewhere just decided that they were selling it. And oftentimes it's because they found something that they might like better. And it's, yeah. well, yeah. you know, I always like how these big pension funds like California mm -hmm. and, and I just was reading about the one in Michigan or something that. They just sold all their all their stock in one one holding that they had, right. and, and you sit there and you go, well, if they've been selling for the last you know quarter, that means it's been driving the price down. Is it time for the price to go up now? <laughs> yeah, actually, you know? I, and here's what I would uh, tell you for, about that. Um, I yeah, I here's how I deal with that. I have there's a small, small portion of my money, and I only look at price movement. That's it. Yeah. By the way, yeah, well, that's what I look at too a lot. Yeah, but, but, but I mean, it's it's the only thing I look at. Okay. Okay. Well, so, I look at the dividend too. I look at the price moving on dividend stocks, is, which is what I'm mostly interested okay. in. So here's a little observation for you: uh, price movement on dividend paying stocks tends to be a little bit slower than it yeah. would be. Well, that's okay. Yeah, and but if you're it, in it for the if you're in it for the dividend, it's okay. Well, I wouldn't use price movement to buy a dividend paying stock unless it was a stock that was coming down and I knew the company extremely well and was really comfortable buying it at lower prices. That's a specific, that's a value oriented technique. Okay. Uh, so I use it and what I normally talk about <laughs> at this point in time on the show, I use a, there's another one that's called momentum investing. There's those two are in opposite spectrums. In fact, one of the guys that was one of the best at this just recently died. His name was uh, Richard Dryhouse, and he'd been doing it for years and years and years. Had a track record that uh, was better than Warren Buffett's for a long time. Uh, unfortunately, he got so big because he was so successful that when you're really large, that doesn't work anymore. You'll move the stocks yourself. When you're buying and selling with that kind of, of clout, the, uh, that strategy, actually, the bigger you get, the more successful you get, the harder it is to repeat itself. But he was primarily a uh, price movement guy. He said he looked at fundamentals, but I remember watching this stuff. So he, was buying, he was buying off the charts. And you can do that successfully. I can show you how I've done it. It's, it's not that hard. It's actually easier than the value investing. Value investing is tough because I, I used to be at a bank that uh, they actually bought my firm. And that bank, I won't name the, <laughs> I don't want to hear from their lawyers, but the, uh, the bank had all kinds of problems because of the firm that I was with who was acquired by the bank, and there were a lot of things that, that blew up once the bank got ownership. And it wasn't the bank's fault, and they could not have known that. And it was a, uh, you know, it's just bad luck sometimes is just, you know, it's bad news. But hey, let, let me ask you one other thing that I've uh, preferred stock. Mm -hmm. Can individuals buy preferred stocks? Yes, you can. I, I wouldn't recommend it like right now. Yeah, well, they, they well they tend to have higher dividends. Yes, there's a reason for that. There's higher well, risk. There. Well, is there really? Yes, absolutely. There's less risk. Nope. Well, because but you look at the you look at the trading on a preferred stock. I mean, very 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 narrow. Doesn't go up much. Doesn't go down much. Oh no no no! I've seen preferred stocks go to zero. No. Okay. Actually, a couple of them I owned. <laughs> okay. Well, so, did, so did so did Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett yeah. owned them too. Okay. And uh, okay. that was actually one of the reasons I thought it was so attractive. And come to find out that they had underestimated 
um, a lot of liabilities this, this, this company had. It looked like they had $2 billion in cash. Okay, cash, not total assets, just cash. And that their total debts were a billion dollars, but somebody had been uh, monkeying around with the numbers, <laughs> and that company went away. Uh, so I, I, I consoled myself. And by the way, Warren Buffett had purchased it right before I did. The other person that had purchased a lot of it was uh, Gary Went. He used to be the uh, CEO of, of GE Capital before he, uh, uh, and he took a job at this company. <laughs> And he put $38 million of his own money. That was back when $38 million was, you know, uh, a lot more money. So uh, those sure things, that it, it, they don't really exist. Everything has risk to it. And it's really, the, the portfolio manager, it's really just managing risk. That's not really knowing because they are, you can't know everything there is to know about it. When you read a, a quarterly report, read the disclaimer before that. I mean, they, they tell it like it is, and I'm glad they do. And when you read the uh, quarterly reports, I mean, it, it would scare two out of three people uh, away from this, you know, that stock. And if they read a couple thousand of them, then they would go, oh, well, this is kind of normal. You know, this is, they, they have to warn you about all the potential things that could happen in the real world. So there's a lot of risk out there. Sure is. Anyway, right. I hear the music. All right. it's, yep. They're kicking All right, me off. <laughs> All right. okay. we'll Have a good you. weekend. Bye. You've been listening to Bill Bullington. If you'd like to get in touch with me, my website's BullingtonCapital.com. Have a good weekend, everybody. Good luck and good investing. <laughs> just caught another edition of the Bullington Capital Report, broadcasting every Saturday at 11 a.m. on AM 1420, The Answer. If you have a question and you'd like to speak to Bill personally, you can call him at 330-664-0700. That's 330-664-0700. Or online at BullingtonCapital.com. That's BullingtonCapital.com. The preceding program has been paid for by Bullington Capital Management, LLC.